Welcome to Word of Hope, Ovarian Cancer Podcast, brought to you in partnership with Word and Libby's Hope. For more links and information on this episode, visit wordofhopepodcast.com. Welcome to the first episode of Word of Hope, Ovarian Cancer Podcast. The Word of Hope brings news and commentary of current ovarian cancer research and education, co-hosted by Paul Cacciatore of Libby's Hope and myself, Nate Manahan from Women's Oncology Research and Dialogue, also known as Word. Paul, I am excited to start these podcasts. While we get started, why don't you uh, tell the listeners and those watching us a little bit about yourself and Libby's Hope. Yeah, I'm Paul Cacciatore. I'm the founder of Libby's Hope. It's an online educational website for ovarian cancer survivors and their family. Paul, as we get started in these first few episodes of Word of Hope Ovarian Cancer Podcast, I think it's great that you're going to help us look at take an overview of 10 exciting ovarian cancer research topics from 2010. So let's take a look back, and we'll start today with one of the most exciting uh, research projects from last year and several of its studies about Avastin. Uh, we'll look at GOG218 Icon 7 in the Ocean Study. So, Paul, why don't you go ahead and get us started? Okay. Today on the drugs, what we're going to start with is probably the one that has the most attention to it, which is uh, the reporting on uh, Bevacizumab, uh, known to most of us as Avastin. Uh, it's an anti-angiogenesis drug, and there's been kind of a hat trick of success here. Uh, with this drug. Uh, There's been three trials, three phase three trials uh, that have reported, which are uh, the GOG-218, Gynecologic Oncology Group 218, they go by the number, Uh, ICON-7, which was an international study, and most recently, this past week, the OCEAN study reported. No, no, not a lot of details, but just um, the general reporting. And so I think the best way to do this, Nate, is probably just to start with a general overview of what all of these signify before we get into any kind of uh, any kind of additional uh, detail. Yeah, how we first touch on why these studies are so important, and maybe give us a take-home message. The take-home message, I think, from these three studies. Well, first, they're great studies because they're all phase three. They were they were larger studies. Um, the second thing you have to keep in mind is no drug has changed the path of first-line ovarian cancer treatment since 1996 in the drug Paxitaxel, otherwise known as Taxol to most of us. Uh, That's a pretty big finding, uh, to have any type of drug have any effect on first-line treatment of ovarian cancer in over a decade is is very, very significant. Um, What they all found, to, to make kind of a long story short, is that they all, all the studies found out that bevacizumab increases progression-free survival, basically from the, you know, from the end of your treatment to when the disease recurs again. That measurement of time is generally referred to as progression-free survival. Um, it, when you go through it, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that uh, it had the effect that it did, uh, which is actually considerable. Um, in that trial, and, and again, we say all these trials come from a slightly different angle. In this trial, what they did is they used, um, uh, they took the standard of care, which today is uh, considered carboplatin and paclitaxel. They added to that uh, basically a cocktail of three, adding a Vastin. Then once that first line treatment was done, they then went ahead and continued uh, with a Vastin in what's known as a maintenance therapy. Just a ma- just a Vastin used by itself after the first three drugs were used. Uh, and the duration for that, I think the total duration in this trial is 15 months. So when you look at from the beginning of the use of Avastin all the way to the end, it's about 15 months. Uh, another thing to note in this trial, GOG-218, uh, GOG-218, is that 75% of the women were suboptimally debulked, uh, which means they're the tougher cases. Uh, when women go in, the hope is when, after their initial surgery for ovarian cancer, you can be left with less than one centimeter of residual disease. If that happens, they call that optimal debulking. Well, these women were suboptimal, which meant they had more than one centimeter of residual disease. And so these are the tougher cases, I would argue, uh, when you look at it. So they had about an increase of progression-free survival, about 3.8 months uh, in here. Uh, Just to give you some idea, some numbers, that's about a 39% improvement. Uh, in progression-free survival. Uh, when you get into kind of the statistics, it's about a 28% reduction in the risk of progression. That's known as a hazard ratio. It's a little more technical. Um, but one interesting thing is, is usually when you measure how well you've done, uh, 
the the hardcore standard is called rhesist uh, criteria. Paul, maybe we should just take a quick detour, and you could explain what rhesist criteria is. R with rhesist criteria, uh, with respect to a tumor, that stands for the response evaluation criteria in uh, solid tumors, a fancy name. Just a set of rules to decide whether a tumor has gotten larger, has shrank, or stayed the same. And the idea is that you use that criteria so you can, ma you can measure apples to apples from clinical trial to clinical trial. Great, Paul. Thanks. Uh, now, maybe let's head back to what they did in the study. Well, uh, what, in, in part of this, they did two measurements, one of which actually measured how well you did based on CA125, a blood, uh, a blood marker uh, for ovarian cancer. Uh, and so if the CH125 went up, the numbers I just gave you on progression-free survival basically include any movement of CH125 up in addition to any findings on, you know, CT scans, PET scans, things like that. The interesting thing is if you take away the CA125, if you take away that, that, that measure of whether a disease has progressed, you end up then with about a 6.2 month increase. So you have basically a 56% increase in progression-free survival and a 36% uh, risk reduction uh, with respect to progression or with death. Uh, side effects, I think it, the good thing I think with all three of these trials is the side effects ran fairly true to what happened in the original pivotal trials. The side effects, which are basically gastrointestinal perforations uh, and uh, also hypertension. And that is one thing that they did find in these trials, that as the duration increased, there, there, there was always an issue about hypertension, but it is something that really has to be monitored as the usage, the time period of use increases. Paul, is there any survival data for this study yet? Um, they don't have any survival data yet in GOG uh, 218. It's still immature data. And, uh, but the good news is about 76% of the patients are still alive in this trial. And even though we don't have survival data yet, I think that's a very good omen. And if you get into the statistical data and look at the curves, uh, although nobody will say that, you know, they can talk about overall survival increase, it certainly looks like the curves are moving in that direction. But again, we won't know until the data matures and they have final numbers on that. I see. Well, let's move on to our next study. How about ICON-7, Paul? Uh, ICON-7, another Avastin trial, kind of interesting. They used half the dose of the drug that was used in uh, GOG-218. Uh, they had more earlier stage patients. They allowed stage one patients that had uh, high grade tumors or clear cell ovarian cancer in. So at least in theory, there were some women that weren't, um, you know, at quite as late stage. They were, they were early stage as well. Half the dosage, again, it's a phase three trial. And they found out it was about a 2.3 month uh, increase in progression-free survival. Uh, and another interesting point with ICON-7 is that all the patients in ICON-7 finished their maintenance, uh, with, which lasted, I think the total duration in the ICON-7 was 12 months, again, compared to 15 months in the GOG trial. And all the patients completed maintenance. Those are some unusual findings. That's an interesting point because in GOG, uh, trial, the, the end point was progression-free, uh, uh, survival. And what they did is once that endpoint was met, they unblinded the study because ethically, once they knew that there was some benefit to the patients, they unblinded it and allowed the patients in the other arms to cross over into the Avastin arm. That's a bit of an issue there in terms of survival data because I think it complicates things a little bit for those researchers down the road in, in, in figuring that out. But aside from that, I think these are two very, very well done studies. Now. The, as we move on to the next trial and the last trial we're talking about, the OCEANS trial, we don't have much data on that yet, correct? Uh, the OCEANS trial is in, unlike the first two, ICON-7-GOG, the OCEANS trial for Avastin is in the recurrent ovarian cancer context, not in the initial treatment of ovarian cancer. And they, they specifically recruited platinum-sensitive uh, platinum ovarian cancer patients which basically means they had a recurrence uh, six months or later after the, the last infusion of the platinum drug they received for their standard of care treatment, um, which are, tend to be somewhat easier patients to treat uh, because they do tend to be sensitive. Uh, and so we really don't have much more information than that yet on OCEANS. They're going to report on that in a, uh, 
uh, probably in the next meeting that will be coming up, we'll begin to see some details from that uh, come out. But uh, but those are the three for uh, you know all dealing with Avastin. I think all very hopeful. And I think what it means is with Avastin now in an ovarian cancer context is it's no longer a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. And what I mean by that is the science, I think, is taking care of itself. There's benefit with this drug. The when is a little bit more of a political issue, a cost issue. Uh, this is a very expensive drug in a healthcare system that's trying to reduce cost. We, we have to compare the cost of the drug to the, at, to the benefit, kind of a cost-benefit analysis to see whether or not this drug's going to be you know, added to the arsenal. Uh, also, I went ahead and took a look, Nate, uh, as of today's taping, and there's 37 open clinical trials now that are using Avastin. And so there's, a, there's actually a pretty nice cadre of trials open for women if they want to try to get access to this drug. And as you know, 37 is a pretty good number. It's, it's a great number. And there are uh, interesting to us as stories, we've gotten some anecdotal stories of some uh, state Medicaid systems that are taking it upon themselves to fund outside of clinical trial maintenance mode of Avastin. Right. So for women that are in, not most women will fit eligible, eligibility probably within one of those 37 clinical trials, but there will be some that might not. And right. there are other options for them even outside the clinical trials to uh, look at Avastin with their physician. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it's going to be a good issue, and it's some, something that needs to be addressed. Um, but again, I, I say if rather than when. The science aspects of this are taking care of themselves. Now, it looks like there's going to be benefit. If I were a betting man, I would say that you're going to see some probably some survival benefit from it. But again, too early to tell. The data hasn't matured yeah. yet. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a, I think it's, you know, it's another weapon in the arsenal of a very difficult-to-treat disease, which I think is very good. Certainly can't have enough of Paul, that is awesome information. Thank you for presenting it. And I think that's probably enough to cover in this episode. But be sure to look for our next episode of the Word of Hope Ovarian Cancer Podcast as we continue through the series of 10 exciting ovarian cancer research topics for 2010. Next episode, we'll be covering PARP inhibitors. Also, for show notes, links, references, be sure to check out wordofhopepodcast.com. Paul's written a lot of great articles with references that cover topics discussed today, and we'll have links to those at wordofhopepodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to Word of Hope, Ovarian Cancer Podcast, brought to you in partnership with Word and Libby's Hope. For more information on this episode and how to subscribe, visit wordofhopepodcast.com.